Ladies and gentlemen, today is the fourth day of the Six Hope meeting. Let me introduce you, the moderator for this session, Professor Yukihiro Shimogaki, Professor of the University of Tokyo. Professor Shimogaki, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Yukihiro Shimogaki from the University of Tokyo. Um, today, uh, I'd like to introduce the lecturer of this morning session, Professor Martin Chaufi. Um, he graduated uh, Harvard University in 1969, and then got PhD degree in 1976. And then he uh, has been a postdoctoral fellow uh, for five, five or six years in Cambridge, United Kingdom, and then joined uh, Columbia University as an assistant professor. He was awarded a uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008 uh, for the GFP. Now he is a professor of Columbia University in the Department of Biological Science. So. The title of today is uh, GFP Lighting Up Life. So please start, Professor Martin Chaufi. Thank you, Dr. Shimagaki. That's a nice introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about sort of the, I am going to talk about sort of a, a little bit of history. And, and I do it for a point, from a point, particular point of view. And that point of view is I, all the things that I learned as an elementary school kid and as a high school student, I learned a lot of things about science. And I learned a lot of things about science because we were given, not because I was exactly taught about this, but I learned about scientists and how they do science by all the examples that I heard. And when Brian Schmidt actually gave his talk, he gave a good example of this, right? He went down the list. I have the list as I wrote it down. Ptolemy, Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Herschel, and on down the line of all the great scientists that had come before. And we hear about Newton, uh, Einstein. We hear the stories connected to these people. And I think we get a very incorrect view of how, who scientists are, and how science is done. So let me sort of start with that. And then I'm going to tell you the GFP story and show how every single one of these things that I learned as a kid is completely wrong. <laughs> OK, so what I was taught in the 1960s, 1950s, and 60s, the first thing is scientists are geniuses. They're just unbelievably special people that are different from the rest of us. And they have this innate ability to just be able to think scientifically there's actually no work involved. They just were born with this. I mean, this is, they're just such unusual people. The second thing is that the scientists, because it's so little time to tell what they did, you just hear their positive result. So their experiments must work every time they do anything, which is because they're very special people. Next is the reason they do this is because they use a peculiar way of thinking that none of the rest of us do, which is called the scientific method. They realize there's a problem they want to investigate. They come up with a hypothesis. They figure out the perfect experiment to test that hypothesis. It works the first time, and they get their reward. And the other thing about all of these examples is that to an exceptional extent, and it was only in sort of the middle 1960s and a little bit later that at least in the lower school they would talk about Watson and Crick. So when I was growing up, everybody seemed to work alone. They were individuals. Now, often, of course, they usually had an assistant, usually named Igor. <laughs> but they did. Nonetheless, they seem to always work alone. And the other aspect of this, and you saw this in Brian Schmidt's list, uh, is that virtually 
everyone that was talked about. In the main, for me, the only exception was Marie Curie. They're all white men. They're all European or European extraction. That's who did science. Nobody else did science. And as I say, I'm going to tell you the GFP story and say that this is complete nonsense, all of these things. So my involvement with green fluorescent proteins started in 1989. And, was, and I had been working in my lab at Columbia for the previous seven years. I had spent five years as a postdoc. And I had been working on this wonderful animal, Cenorhabditis elegans, a roundworm, a nematode. And uh, we were doing experiments on sensory biology. Scientists, biologists know quite a lot about how we detect the world around us. We've known for over 130 years that the molecule that allows us to detect light, rhodopsin, we know what that molecule is. In the last 30, 35 years or so, we've learned about the molecules that are needed for us to detect chemicals, whether they're involved in the sense of smell or taste or whether they are the receptors for hormones or neurotransmitters. We know how signaling is done at a molecular level. But we have a vast array of senses that don't work by light or through chemical detection. They work because cells are mechanically manipulated. And this physical manipulation leads to an electrical current in the cells. So, for example, the fact that you can hear me uh, works because hair cells in our inner ear respond to mechanical signals. Our sense of acceleration. We have five different types of cells in our skin that detect different types of touch. We have cells in our muscles and tendons that detect stretch. We detect blood pressure. And all of these senses have one thing in common. We do not know how they work at the molecular level. And so the idea we had was to take this little worm and very sophisticated apparatus. We take an eyebrow hair, glue it to a toothpick, and we tickle the animal. And we look for animals that didn't move that when we tickled them. And then we had to make sure they weren't dead. Uh, but <laughs> we were able to collect lots of mutants that were touch insensitive. And I'm not really going to talk about that now, except to say that in about 1988, 1989, we had characterized the mutations we had, and we were starting to clone the genes that were defective in the various mutant animals. And the very first question we wanted to address was, OK, we have the gene. Where is it expressed? In what cells in the animal does this gene have to be turned on for us to be able to get a touch-sensing animal? And we hoped it would be in the six nerve cells that we knew were the sensing cells of the animal. But we weren't sure, and we wanted to find it out. Now, at the time, there were several ways of being able to tell this, because, as you know, DNA makes RNA, makes protein. So one way you can look to see whether a gene has been activated is to simply ask, is the protein made? And you can see that using an antibody that will go to the protein. Another way is to go right for the RNA by using probes that will bind to the RNA with a procedure called in situ hybridization. And it may be a little hard in the back to see here, but there are the cells staining uh, for the production of the RNA. A third method that uh, Malcolm Kassadaman uh, developed in the early 1970s was to use the bacteria, the E. coli uh, protein beta-galactosidase, and a substrate for that enzyme that would turn blue called XGAL. And the idea was you had your gene not make its normal product, but rather make the product, the enzyme, and then give the substrate. Now, all of these procedures answered the question. They allowed us to ask what cells activate the gene. But there was a problem with this. First of all, these were uh, cells that, I mean, these were procedures that were very difficult to, to do. They took several hours, at least. So anything that takes more than a couple minutes is a difficult procedure. Uh, and in order to do these experiments, we had to really prep the, the cells, the, organ, the animals. And what I mean by that is we had to kill them, 
We had to fix them, meaning we didn't want anything to move around after we had stopped everything. And then because we needed to get the antibody into the animal or the RNA or the DNA probe for the in situ hybridization or the substrate for the beta galactosidase activity, we had to permeabilize them. So the necessity of killing and doing all this stuff to them meant that we got a very static view of what was going on. So it answered the question, but it left a lot to be desired. And of course, because we killed the prep, if we wanted to see what happened over time, we'd have to do all these time courses, and then we'd have to do it all over again. And my life changed when I went to a seminar, April 25th, 1989. I'm sitting in the seminar, a man named Paul Brem is talking, and his introduction uh, is, he starts telling the story of Osamu Shimomura and his work finding bioluminescence in the jellyfish aquaria of Victoria. Now, if you have some time, please go to the NobelPrize.org website and either listen to his 29-minute acceptance speech or read his, the, the speech. It is really quite remarkable. At the age of 16, when he's in high school, he's told, you have to quit school. That's it. It's over. You have to work in a factory. I think it was a paint factory he had to work in. So, quit school, he goes over the mountains that are adjacent to the city he was born in, and he starts working in the factory. This actually turns out to be eventful, because the city is Nagasaki, Japan, and the year is 1945, and by being on the other side of the mountains, he was protected when the atomic bomb destroyed the city. He went in and he helped people, uh, but he couldn't go to college. And the reason he couldn't go to college is there was no college anymore. Eventually, they rebuilt part of the college near where he was living. It was the only place he could go. He didn't want to go to it, but he went anyway to go to college. It was the pharmacy school. He then gets a job after graduating from college at Nagoya University, and he's given a project we often give, or we try to give, to graduate students and postdocs. And this is the project that we, we, we build this wonderful story about how this is a great project to work on, and we somehow neglect to tell you that this has already been given to several people who have failed at it. And that, uh, it, as far as we can tell, no one will ever be able to get it to work, but you've just come in a lab and it's your good fortune to be told this. Except he gets it to work. He actually figures out how this small crustacean, Cypridina, generates light. And it introduces him to the general problem of how do organisms produce light, which I think is a fascinating question, and one that he's really spent his entire life working on. Now, the consequences of his get, being able to figure out the biochemistry of this bioluminescence were two, two, twofold that I think are really interesting. The first is he gets invited to come to the United States to work on bioluminescence of other organisms, and the second is his boss at Nagoya University arranges a rather unusual going away present for him. He gets his PhD. Not a bad present to get. You do something. So he goes to the United States, and he goes to Friday Harbor Lab uh, on the West Coast, and he decides he's going to figure out how this jellyfish produces light. And this is where the scientific method comes in. He does the prep as he's always done in biochemistry. He's a very, very good biochemist. And as he's doing it, uh, he, he does the prep. He's collecting hundreds, then thousands of jellyfish, grinds them up, gets nothing. Repeats it, nothing. Changes things, nothing. The whole summer, things do not work. No matter what he thinks of, no matter what variation he tries, nothing works at all. One day, he works so late into the night, it's now dark. And the prep has failed again. And because it's failed again, he decides it's probably time to go home for dinner, and that's it for the day. And so he takes the prep that hasn't worked, and he throws it in the sink. 
Now the sink had the discharge from the, of the seawater from the tanks that they kept the jellyfish and other fish in the, the lab. And so he, uh, he just throws it away. And he then turns off the light and he's about to go home. He happens to look back at the sink and he sees that it's glowing brightly. He's a little surprised at this, as you might imagine. And he goes, and he thinks about it, and he says, you know, the seawater has something in it I've never tried in my prep. It has calcium. And so in the next days, he uses calcium, and he sees that that's the magic ingredient. He adds calcium, and he gets light out of the prep. And he can then use that to purify the protein, which he names after the jellyfish a quora. And he's, he's solved his problem. So I, I just want to point out that in biochemistry, uh, there's really somewhat of a time-honored tradition of either throwing things on the floor or in the sink and things working out. But it's definitely not the scientific method. In any case, that was a nice accidental discovery. The second accident that I refer to in the title here of the slide is that when he looks at this, oh, I should say, a quorum became, uh, several years later, the first calcium indicator for cells. You can inject this in the cells, and whenever the cells build up the amount of calcium they have in it, you get this flash of light. So it's a way of seeing in a living cell what would happen if there was a change in calcium levels. And, but he's looking at it, and he, see, he has a problem. The problem is it's the wrong color. Because what is produced is a blue light, and he knows that the jellyfish produces a green light. So he thinks about that for a while and realizes maybe there's a second protein. And this protein will get the blue light and convert it to green. And so he takes a handheld ultraviolet lamp and he goes to all of his protein samples, all of his fractions, and he looks at them and he indeed finds one that when you shine ultraviolet or blue light on it, you get green. And in his 1962 paper, when he's reporting the purification of a quorum, he puts his footnote number three, a couple of sentences. We've also noted that the, the color is wrong and that we, there is another protein that, I, that he called at the time green protein. We call it, of course, green fluorescent protein. He says, and this will produce the green color. This, as far as I know, and Gunnar may be able to correct me, as far as I know, this is the only footnote that has won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, in any case, he finds that this other protein, GFP, green fluorescent protein, when it's present with a quorum and calcium, now the light that's produced is green. I'm listening to this in a seminar, and you have to remember something. I'm interested in when genes are active in cells. And one of the things I forgot to say about that first slide is that this wonderful worm that I work on has a particular property that was exceptionally important for me being interested in this. It is transparent. So there were other people listening to the seminar. They worked on frogs or mice or other organisms or things in test. They didn't work on a transparent animal. But I wanted something that I could see where genes were turned on, and I worked in a transparent animal. And I just stopped listening to the seminar. I just fantasized about all the wonderful things we could do if we could put this protein into our worms. And I got on the phone the next day. Uh, oh, but, so I realized that all we had to do is put it in the animal, shine blue light on it. We'd get green light out. We could see wherever it was. We wouldn't have to permeabilize the animal. We wouldn't have to add substrates. The substrate was light, blue light. So, it would serve as a lantern, a way of seeing where things were active or so on. And we had lots of other ideas about what would happen. So the next day, I got in touch with this man, Douglas Prasher. Oh, I should explain the color code before I go on. The color code is as follows. Anyone whose name is in red is someone who worked in my lab. Anyone whose name is in blue is a collaborator. And anyone whose name is in black did something I wish I had done. <laughs> you see that Shimamura's name was in black. So 
Gia had just come to my lab as a new graduate student. She had finished, uh, oh, let me start this over. Douglas and I had a conversation in 1989. He was in the process of getting the DNA for green fluorescent protein, and we wanted to put it in worms. We had a wonderful conversation, and then we lost track of each other for three years. I thought he had not succeeded in getting the DNA, and he thought I had dropped out of science. We just lost communication. But in 1992, Gia came into the lab as a new graduate student, and she had already gotten a master's working on fluorescence in our engineering school. So I figured she was the perfect person to do this project, and I said, well, it's a guy. He didn't get it, but maybe there's another fluorescent protein, and the university had just put Medline, which was the precursor to PubMed, on our computers, and we looked up fluorescent protein, and there was Douglas's paper cloning the DNA. So we got in touch with him again, and he sent, immediately sent us the samples of, of the DNA, and Gia's job was to put it into bacteria, which she did. And this is one of those cases where the experiment worked the first time, and I'm going to tell you in a moment why, how important it was that the experiment did work the first time. In any case, this is a page from her lab notebook one month after she started graduate school, in which you see here, or you may not be, I'll read it to you, it says fluorescing E. coli, strongly. Now, there's something else hidden in this slide, uh, in, that, in this page, and it says that she used the microscope in engineering. This is the microscope in her previous lab that she had worked in. This was very important, because when she put the samples of bacteria under my microscope, she immediately couldn't tell because my microscope at the time was a piece of junk. <laughs> and as a result, we weren't, the fluorescence wasn't very good on it, uh, and she couldn't really tell, but she knew where there was a much better microscope, and so she went back to her old lab, and then she even took this picture on that very first night when she got the results when the bacteria grew up. This presented us with a problem, so I want to talk a little bit about doing science. Uh, presented us with a problem because uh, we didn't have a microscope to do this, and you can see how important a microscope would be for this. So I called up all of the sales representatives of the various microscope companies that were in New York, and I said, we have just developed a new way to look at gene expression. It uses fluorescence, and we're going to buy a new microscope but we don't know which one to use. So if they would please bring by their microscope so we could try it out. And if they could leave it for a month or two, we could give it a really good test. So if you look in our paper, you'll see a footnote that lists a whole bunch of microscopes. Those were the loner microscopes that we used. So we did everything on borrowed microscopes, but we got it done. Now, this experiment sounds pretty simple. Put it into E. coli, and you get green things out of it. However, everybody that had worked on GFP was absolutely convinced that this was an amazingly stupid experiment and one that would not work. And let me explain why. It was known that GFP didn't need any cofactors. You didn't have to add anything to it. That the molecule that was fluorescent was derived entirely from the amino acid sequence of the protein, polypeptide. However, there was a very strange thing that happened to this molecule. Specifically, we like to think about polypeptides as long chains of amino acids, and we have this linear chain of, of atoms, the peptide backbone. And, but in GFP, this rearranges these five atoms here, rearrange, so you get this five-membered ring that allows for the fluorescence to take place. And without that condensation, it doesn't work. And no one knew how that took place. But everyone was sure that it was going to take at least one, maybe two, maybe five, or more converting enzymes to do this reaction. And so if it needed something else, then it was a worthless thing for what we wanted to use it for, because you'd have to put all the components in. But Gia's single experiment of being able to show that she could just put the coding sequence for GFP into the bacteria said it doesn't need any special enzyme to convert it. 
In fact, it converts itself. And so it can be used completely on its own. But I want to point out, if you did this experiment and it didn't work the first time, or maybe even the second time, you would then conclude, yes, they're right, there must be a converting enzyme. And I've learned that subsequent, after we introduced GFT, I learned that three other laboratories were trying to do the same experiment. How did we succeed? And they all did not. Now, it has to do with the clone of the, the sequence that Douglas Prasher had isolated and given to us. This sequence, the, you don't have to know anything except the green part is the coding sequence for green fluorescent protein, and the red part is other jellyfish sequence. It had been cloned using one of those restriction enzymes that Rich Roberts had talked about, EcoR1, and so the piece from the jellyfish was cut out because it had at the ends the sequences for the restriction enzyme EcoR1. And the other three groups, wanted to, we all wanted to put this into our favorite organism or whatever we wanted to work on. And there are two ways of doing the experiment. One way was careful, and the other way was sloppy. We opted for sloppy. Let me explain what I mean. If you have bacteria growing up with this lambda phage in it, they will grow up and make perfect copies of the sequence. And then you can cut them out with the enzyme, and you know that there hasn't been much that has changed. There'll be a few copies, but very small amount. But at the time, there was a, another way of being able to amplify the DNA, and that was to use a polymerase chain reaction, PCR, and that way you could just copy exactly what you wanted. The only problem was it was not very good because it introduced mistakes. But we wanted to put this into E. coli. We were going to put it into hundreds of millions of bacteria. We weren't going to put it into one. So my reasoning was, I don't want anything extra. I just want the coding sequence. Because even if there are mistakes, and a lot of it doesn't work, if one molecule works and we get that into the bacterium, we're going to see a fluorescent bacterium. So we don't want everything to work. We just want some of it to work. And so that's what we did. We, got, we only copied out the green bit. The other people had the red bits, and there's something, and no one's actually worked this out to figure out what the problem is. The red bits prevent the, of the whole thing from working. And so they, of course, would conclude, you need a converting enzyme. This is not very interesting. So just the happenstance of how we decided to do the experiment. We then put this in the worms. We got excited enough about it that we said we were going to publish. We wanted to publish it in a journal that would reach as many people as possible. We didn't want to do it just to the neurobiologists or the cell biologists or the developmental biologists. We wanted it to a very broad range of people because we thought that this was going to be a very good tool for a lot of people to do. So we sent it to science. So I want to talk a little bit about scientific publishing. We sent it to science. It actually did get published, but not without some difficulties. The first difficulty. You may know that uh, the people at science take themselves unbelievably seriously. And as a result, they have quite a number of demands. And one of the things they do is they don't just take your paper and send it out to reviewers. They have to cogitate over it. They have to think about whether it's worthy enough to even be reviewed. And they called me up and they said, you know, we're sorry, we're not going to send your paper out. And I said, well, what's wrong with the paper? They said, well, to tell you the truth, the thing we really don't like about your paper is the title. And I said, wait a minute, but uh, what do you mean? The title, I like the title. The title is Green Fluorescent Protein, a New Marker for Gene Expression. And they said, well, you see, at science, everything is new. So you cannot use that word in the title. I said, can I change the title? Will you let me, uh, will you send it out to reviewers? I think they actually said maybe. <laughs> but I don't like being told what to do. 
It really rubs me the wrong way. So you can see that in the title I submitted for the paper to be reviewed, which was a bit extensive. The Acora Victoria green fluorescent protein needs no exogenously added component to produce a fluorescent product in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And uh, it got reviewed and it got accepted. And then the uh, copy editor called me up and said, do you know that your title is a little long? And I said, oh, would you like me to make it shorter? And they said, yes. And I said, OK, how's this for a title? Green fluorescent protein as a marker for gene expression. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. And that's the, that's the title. But that was the first of three problems we had with publication. The second problem has to do with this picture that did get on the cover. I really wanted this picture to go on the cover because what this picture is is of a living worm, newly hatched, and you can actually see this nerve cell growing out. That's its growth cone. And I wanted this to be sort of a symbol of the fact that you could watch life happen. And so I really, would, I really wanted to have this on the cover. And the, art, the cover editor calls me up and says, we really like your picture. and We're going to use it on the cover. But we have a problem. I said, OK, what's the problem? They said, you see, there's one color that doesn't reproduce well on the cover. Uh, and we never like to use it, and that's green. Can we change the color to another, change the picture, use a different color? And I said, absolutely not. This is actually a somewhat enhanced picture. If you go and look at the journal, it really is washed out, but I just couldn't have them change it. The third thing is, we had been giving away, the paper was published in February, we were giving away samples of GFP to people starting uh, the previous October and telling people about this. And so lots of people were working with it. And I was already getting people writing me back and saying, it works. It works in my system. It works here. It works there. And I wanted to be able to say in the, the paper that other people had had success in other organisms. And so I wrote these people. I said, do you mind if I cite your unpublished work uh, in the paper? And we have put all of these in a, in a footnote. And all the people except for one were very kind and said, you gave it to us way before publication. Of course you can. This is absolutely fine. And so we were able to cite all these interesting experiments that were already starting to be done. One person, however, made an excessive amount of demands. And that, that you can't really read the letter, but what she wanted was for me to make coffee every Saturday morning for two months straight. Uh, prepare a special French dinner, and then take out the garbage nightly for a month. This is my wife, <laughs> Tula Hazelrig. Uh, but what, Tula, and, and she claims I've never actually ever paid up on this, but um, what Tula did was really the next spectacular step in GFP work. What she did, what we had done, you know, genes can be simply thought of as the part that's the product, what RNA or protein is made. And then there's all the control regions. And so we had, what we had done is we had taken the control region, where, when, and how much should be made, and we had that make GFP. What she did is she took the whole gene and tacked GFP onto the protein coding sequence so that it would literally be a lantern hanging on the protein that she was interested in. We have a little conflict in our family. I work on worms, she works on flies, but nonetheless, we seem to get along. Um, and what she was interested in, this is a developing oocyte. These cells here are called the nurse cells. And the protein she was interested in is made by the nurse cells. And you see this little yellow spot here. This is where the, the GFP labeled protein is actually moving into the developing oocyte where it comes to lie on this edge. And over here, and she was able to watch the protein being made in one cell and move into another. So she was, she was the person who made the first protein fusion. And a, a really remarkable discovery, a, a result. And her paper was published about, I think, four months after ours, uh, showing that this could be done. So it was the first protein fusion. Uh, why is GFP interesting, useful? First of all, all you need to do to get an organism to make it is to put the DNA encoding GFP into the organism. And so once you put it in, all the subsequent progeny 
will be able to have GFP. So you do the prep once, and then you use it for all sorts of interesting things. Looking at GFP just requires that you shine blue light on the sample. You don't have to have any permeabilization, any fixing or anything. Uh, and shining blue light is, is, blue light is fairly innocuous. So this is as close to a non, uh, sort of non-invasive measure of what's going on in cells. So you can watch things happen. It's a relatively small molecule. It's got 238 amino acids. And that means that, that this is 1 16th the size of the beta-galactosidase molecule, which is an obligate tetramer. And so what it means is GFP can diffuse throughout the cell. And so you can now see all the cell. Beta-galactosidase basically stays in the cell body. So you can see an entire outline of the cell with this. And finally, as I've already said several times, you can watch life happening. You get a dynamic view of biological processes, not a static view. GFP has been used in an astonishing number of organisms, uh, all sorts of animals, plants, bacteria, archaea, just about anything you can imagine. I don't think it's been put in the whales, but you know, uh, it, it, in virtually every organism. So this is a little bit of a rogues gallery. Here is the entire nervous system of this worm we work on, C. elegans. Here's fruit fly, canola plants, mice, Zebrafish, uh, you can actually go to pet stores and buy these. They're called glowfish. And uh, this is Alba, the GFP bunny, which the artist Eduardo Koch, uh, he's Brazilian, lives in Chicago. He commissioned a French biotech company to make Alba for him so that he could go to his various art shows and get people talking about the connection between art and science and art and technology. Uh, Alba was the family pet for many years. Uh, here are some cells. Uh, fibroblast and culture, this is uh, Drosophila, this is the mustard plant, Arabidopsis, and this is a mouse Purkinje cell in the back of our heads and our cerebellum, and you can see how GFP has just outlined the entire cell and allowed it to be uh, visualized. I want to show you a couple movies, and um, first I want to, for the non-biologist, I want to talk about what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you two movies uh, that are looking at nuclear division in the early fruit fly embryo. Now, in the early fruit fly embryo, there are no cell boundaries. The nuclei just keep dividing and dividing. And what I'm going to show you is first a movie in which GFP has been attached to a protein that makes up this apparatus called the spindle on which the chromosomes reside and are moved to the two separate parts of the cell so that the cell can divide and you split the chromosomes between them. So this, but you'll see that the spindle only occurs during the division of the nucleus. Other than that, it's not there. The other movie I'm going to show you has GFP with a small peptide attached to it called a nuclear localization signal. What this does is whenever there's a nucleus, GFP is sucked into the nucleus. But during division, the nuclear envelope breaks down. There is no nucleus, and so it's going to be all over the embryo. Okay? So let's go look at these movies. This, they're both with GFP. This is the one of the spindle. Let me start that. And you see a spindle forming. This is very speeded up. And we're going to actually go through, I think, four rounds of this. Um, this is all done by Rosalind Silverman Gavrilla. I got it from the American Society for Cell Biology website. Uh, she, I think she made these when she was a uh, graduate student uh, in Canada. And the thing I hope you see about these movies, th this movie, is that everything is synchronous. In fact, she called this movie in synchrony. And so being able to look at these things over time immediately gives you the question of what's doing the coordination. How are all of these individual nuclei dividing with the same time course. And we know quite a lot about the biology of that, but I'll let one of these other meetings, let Tim Hunt talk about that. Now, the movie on the right is the one with the nuclear localization signal. So we actually start off with the nuclei intact, and they have GFP in them. But this has been falsely colored. And it's falsely colored, and the usual convention is you go through the spectrum and you go from blue, that means the least, 
all the way to red, which is the most. And so here we have the nuclei. Let's start this movie. The nuclei break down. GFP goes everywhere in the embryo. And now the nuclei are going to reform. And it's being sucked into the nuclei. She calls this Starry Night after the Van Gogh uh, painting, which I think is very appropriate. And, this is, and, and as you look at this, I, th I hope you're struck by the fact that it's not synchronous. That in fact, there's a wave of the loss or the gain of this going off in this direction. What this actually means is this embryo is probably damaged. So there's a very fine way of looking. The divisions are still taking place, but there, it's probably it's pressed a little bit hard in, in between the cover slip and the glass. But at least you can see that with this, and also looking at this process. GFP has been used in an astonishing number of ways. I divide them up into basic, applied, and uh, the truly unexpected. Uh, what do I mean by basic? It's been used to look at gene expression, protein localization, use it. Once you label something, you can then mutate the organism and see if the things look different or in different places and so on. Uh, you can label tissues and cells. You can isolate tissues and cells because they have uh, this fluorescence in them. Uh, a whole series of different things. And I'll show you some examples of that. By applied, it's certainly been used uh, related to questions about uh, health. And we, people have looked at it to look at met metastasis of cancer in mice to study the process. We're not talking about putting this in humans. To look at how HIV, the virus for AIDS, is transmitted from cell to cell. To look at it, uh, the effects of mutations that are known to cause inherited diseases, infection. It's been used in biotechnology. It's been used for drug discovery. And it's been used to make biosensors of a whole variety of types. And then the things that I would call unexpected. Uh, there's been new research. People decide, wait a minute, there should be other fluorescent proteins. And in fact, Lukianov and Matz in Russia, these are people that love to go scuba diving. And they knew that corals were fluorescent. And so they said, maybe it's the same sort of protein as GFP. And they went in and they found the first red fluorescent protein. Carl Dieseroff at Berkeley, who's made quite a career of looking at what are called optogenetic tools, told me once that the reason he went out looking for these molecules was because of GFP. That GFP excited him about, this, about the possibility that there were other molecules that could be equally useful. And he's proven that's right. People have looked at new types of chemistry. It, there's been an effect on industry. Soon after I got the Nobel, uh, I was asked to talk to a group. Uh, and afterwards, uh, after I gave my talk, uh, I was given a little you know, gift. And the person who presented it was the president of Zeiss Microscopes in the United States, Jim Sharp. And he comes up to me and says, Marty, you don't know this, but around 1994, when your paper came out, before your paper came out, Zeiss was seriously considering stopping the production of fluorescent microscopes. But after your paper came out, so many people wanted to use fluorescence that it revived that part of the industry. And uh, I want to thank you for all that you've done for us. And I said, oh, does that mean you're going to give me a microscope? <laughs> and he said, uh, no. <laughs> and then it's been used in art. And I'll show you some examples. I'll show you some uh, other unusual things. So in our own lab, we've used it to ask where are genes expressed. So here's a gene that's actually expressed in the touch sensing cells that's needed for touch sensitivity. Here's one that's expressed in muscle, but is also just needed for touch sensitivity. So there's an interaction between the muscle and the nerve cells. We looked at where proteins are localized. We look at where, if we, we can isolate the touch cells out of the animal because they have green fluorescent protein in them. And of course, when you look at something like this, you can immediately ask questions like, are there genes important that determine the number of cells? But we, and we've been able to find mutants that have fewer cells or more cells. Are the cells in the right place? Do the cells all grow out this single process that goes forward? Or can they have multiple processes, like, like here? 
what determines the exact cell shape? By being able to look at the things, we can really now start to attack this genetically and, and look at them in, in many ways. Of course, people are a little bit greedy. Uh, scientifically, they, want, they always want more. I think that's good. And the person that's probably done more to give people more about fluorescent proteins is the third person that shared the Nobel Prize with us, Roger Chen, who uh, was very interested to make various colors. He did make the first color, which was a blue fluorescent protein. And then with the discovery of the coral proteins, uh, his lab really went to town and made all of these wonderful colors. Actually, this is a subset of, I think it's about 15 of them now. And he names them no longer about by the, uh, no longer by letters, GFP, YFP, RFP, things like that. He, he names them after fruits. I think this is blueberry. I'm pretty sure that's melon, that's lime, that's banana, that's orange, and that's either cherry or tomato. I'm not really sure. But having a bunch of colors means you can look at a number of different things. And so this has probably been taken to its extreme by Josh Sainz and Jeff Lickman at Harvard, who went and said, we want to label every single nerve cell in the mouse brain. And so they decided to take four colors spanning the spectrum and make them in varying amounts in different cells, so a variable amount of expression, and they would thereby get a whole series of different colors to label the cells. Now, if you want to label all the cells in the central nervous system of a mouse, and you want to have all the colors of the spectrum, there's actually only one name for this, and that's brain bulb. And these are some of their pictures, which are really quite spectacular. But Roger had another idea, which I think is quite wonderful. And that idea uh, takes it, uh, into account a very nice property of fluorescent molecules, and that is if two fluorescent molecules are close enough together and have the right properties, uh, the first one won't make light. It'll just transfer its energy to the other one. But they have to be virtually touching. And he realized that. So then the idea here is, of course, you, you sh shine ultraviolet light onto a blue fluorescent protein. And for the most part, you get blue light out. But a little bit of the blue light, because it's going to go off in all directions, is going to go and hit the yellow fluorescent protein, and you're going to get a little yellow light out of this, too. But if the molecules are touching one another, then when you excite with ultraviolet light, the energy that would go to making blue light is going to be transferred to the yellow fluorescent protein, activating it. And so you're going to wind up with a little bit of blue light coming out and a lot more yellow light coming out. Now, in the first example that Roger and his lab put together, they used a, a linker here that changed its conformation when calcium was present, thus making a calcium indicator because when calcium was elevated in the cells, you'd get yellow light. When it's not, you get blue light. So he was able to monitor cells. And so this is entirely encoded by DNA. You can put it into cells. It's a cellular monitor. This, process of having this close is called Forster, whoops, what did I do? I don't know how that happened, but we will do this anyway. It's called FRET or Forster Resonance Energy Transfer. Sometimes people call it fluorescence resonance energy transfer. And it can be used in a lot of different ways. For example, here's, an ex here's one case where you put a peptide between the two molecules such that they're very close to each other, so you get mainly blue light out. But if a protease comes around that can cut this, if it gets cut, the two parts are going to go far apart from each other. Now you're going to get mainly blue light instead of mainly yellow. And so as a result, you can say when a protease is active in the cell. And people have made hundreds of these cellular monitors to look at all sorts of activities within cells, and they're very exciting as ways to do it. Another thing, and this is a somewhat embarrassing example that I'm going to give, is a, uh, one day my wife said to me, what if you cut GFP in half, put it into two parts, and then put the two halves together, express the two halves? Do you think you get GFP back again? And I said, no, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard of. And then a couple of years later, I met Lynn Regan, who had done exactly that. She's a professor in the chemistry department at Yale. And uh, I had to go back and tell my wife 
that uh, I was an idiot. Um, in any case, what Lynn found is if you do cut GFP in half, of course it doesn't come back together. But she had the very uh, clever thought that if she took two peptide domains that normally stick to each other, then once they did stick to each other, then the two halves of GFP could come together and it would reconstitute the GFP. And this has been used by a number of people to test protein-protein interactions because you put one protein with one half of GFP and the other protein with the other half, and you put it together. People in my lab realized that there was another use for this. And so what they did is they, they said, well, you know, if we express one half from the promoter of one gene, and it'll be in a whole bunch of cells, and we express the other half from another gene that's expressed in a whole bunch of different cells, but there's one in common, that's the only one that'll be lit up. So we can get a specificity that we can't get by expressing just a single one, and that actually worked. We could label a very specific set of cells. Now, you may have seen the, the poster by Peng Xiao, uh, uh, Xia, and uh, the poster session where he's now done this as well with the photoactivatable GFP and, and used that to a very good effect. So if you didn't see the poster, you should go in and, and or talk to him. I don't know if it's still up. Let me point out one of these medically related things. How is HIV transferred? Now, when you go to, you're in a, a, a course, you know, undergraduate course in biology, you learn about bacteriophages, and you sort of get an idea that the way viruses work is they infect the cell, the cell explodes, and the virus goes everywhere and infects other cells, this lysis effect. And so if that's the case, that's actually a pretty good idea, because if the cell explodes and releases all of this, then you could maybe have a vaccine making an antibody that could attach to those virus particles when they're released, and then they could be gotten out of the way. This sounds like a good technique, but only if this is how the virus is transmitted. And so uh, I want to show you a movie here of a cell that the HIV proteins are labeled with GFP, and here's another cell, unlabeled, and you see this particle is being butted off, and there it goes into the cell. It never went outside the cell. There was no lysis. This means antibodies can't get access to this, and that's a problem. So you need to really start looking, instead of at the idea of maybe a vaccine, although there may be ways of, of making that work, you really have to look at this connection between cells. How do these receptors work and how does this transfer take place? And you get to see it by GFP. I talked about biosensors. I talked about what uh, Roger and his lab and other people have done in terms of cellular monitors. But there have been other things, too. And one of the most inventive is by a guy named Bob Burledge who was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And he had an interesting idea. He wanted to make a bacterium. He knew there was, there were, there was a gene in bacteria, in E. coli, that, uh, I think it's E. coli, that can be turned on, can be activated in the presence of the explosive TNT. And so he wanted to make a bacterium that would turn green in the presence of TNT. And he made it. He put the right promoter with the, the gene. And it worked great in a dish. And because he was at Oak Ridge National Lab, which has access to these things, he had a friend of his get five landmines, because landmines leak TNT. And so he had a friend bury the landmines in a three meter by five meter plot of land. And he came back, he came to the land. Now, they're not stupid scientists. These were disconnected, but they did have TNT in them. And he came back after a while, and he sprayed the ground with his bacteria, and then came at night with an ultraviolet lamp and was able to see where the landmines had been buried. Now, the, the reproducibility of the experiment is not very good, and uh, there's been problems, but I know of at least two other groups that have used this and have looked at this. And so uh, I don't know why it never gets published, but I know people are working on this stuff. But I think this is a wonderful thing, since landmines are probably one of the worst aspects of warfare, because they're left to maim and kill innocent people well after the combatants have left. And this is a way of getting around that, to be able to detect these things without people getting hurt, which I think is quite remarkable. And I like this sort of novel way of, of thinking about this. So let me talk about, uh, I'm going to try something here. I'm going to do an experiment that I have never done before. 
but we'll try to do that. And if I could have the lights out, I'm going to show you some, one of the unexpected things. So uh, my tie, oh, let me see. If, there we go. There. This is a blue light. Blue, you see blue? Not very exciting. I'm going to put a yellow filter in front of this, and if we're lucky, you're going to see the fluorescence of that. Okay, can we have the lights back on? So what is this? Here in Japan, National Institute for Agrobiology Science, uh, these two individuals and several others have been making silk moths that have the silk protein attached with GFP and other fluorescent proteins. So here are some of the cocoons. Here's one in white life, and that's with GFP in it. Uh, this is with an orange fluorescent protein that is with red. Uh, uh, so they're able to do it, and they've made some garments already, and they gave me a tie yesterday. That's why you see the, the hope symbols back here, because they came by yesterday to do this. So that's really one of the very unexpected things. And, quite happy about this, obviously. The other thing is, uh, I said that this was used in art. I'm not sure if what I'm going to show you is actually art. But this is supposed to be the first human transgenic with GFP. <laughs> if you look at the beginning of the movie, Ang Lee's movie Hulk, you will see that the movie starts out with a jellyfish. And then a big hypodermic comes in and sucks out the GFP. And there's a lab notebook that says bioluminescent and gives the original name of the jellyfish, which was Aquaria aquaria, not Aquaria victoria. And uh, so Shimomura clearly should have watched the movie before he extracted it. Uh, but I actually know the, the screenwriter, uh, James Shamas, because he's at Columbia in our School of the Arts. And I went to him, and his daughter, my daughter, went to school together. So I went to him and I said, James, how did you know about my work? This is just terrific that you have this in the movie. And he said, I have no idea what you do. <laughs> I said, no, the green fluorescent protein, how did you know to use that? And he said, oh, that. We had a guy from MIT that was working on the set, and he convinced us to do this. It's terrific. I don't care who, who he had the idea. I think it was wonderful. Let me close by telling you some of the lessons. I hope you've already gotten the idea that all those things I said at the beginning are wrong. Now let me give you some ideas about what I have learned from GFP. First is that scientific success comes in many different ways. I told you uh, Osamu Shimamura's story. Uh, Roger Chen was one of these people that we have a contest in the United States called the, uh, used to be called the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. Um, and now it's called the Intel. And he won it as a high school kid. He was doing groundbreaking science very early in his life. Uh, and he's continued to do so. I'm not going to show you my grades or tell you anything about how I was in college, except they, they were definitely not stellar. I actually talked at a, re, a college reunion, and I showed my grades to the, the class. And for the whole rest of the time, people came up to me and said, you know, you're so brave to show those grades. We're so happy you did that, because I've been embarrassed about my grades my entire life, but now seeing yours. Uh, <laughs> So really doesn't make any difference. But it, you get there, I think, more from passion and a desire to really know things than grades or any of these other silly things that we worry about early on. I think the story of GFP says that many, if not most, of the discoveries in science are accidental. Throwing things in the sink is a good way to start sometimes. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful phrase by the physicist Enrico Fermi that goes something on the order of, if you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, then you have made a measurement. But if it doesn't confirm your hypothesis, then you've made a discovery. So you've got to do a lot of experiments in order to find the ones that are the, the, the new and different things. But they do come, surprising, not surprisingly, because usually we don't know what we're doing, and surprises come all the time. Next. I think it's really important to be somewhat ignorant about what's going on, to certainly be stubborn and just follow whatever your idea is, and have a willingness to try to do the experiments. There's a long tradition in biology, certainly, I think in other sciences, to do what I would call a weekend experiment. This is an experiment you do Friday night, or Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. In other words, a time when other people are not around. 
because you're so embarrassed about the idea, but you really want to find out what it is. So you come in and you do the experiment, and you try to do the experiment, and if it works, you crow about it on Monday morning. If it doesn't work, you ask people how their weekends went. <laughs> but I think it's really important to do it. If we had listened to people that said, there's going to be a converting enzyme, this is a silly experiment to do, I wouldn't be standing here. Next. Scientific progress is not the result of an individual. Scientific progress is the result of many individuals. We have, it, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to talk to Gunnar about this, but they must have had a horrible time trying to decide who were the three people that were going to get this prize, because as I've shown you, there were many people involved in this. And in fact, there have been thousands of people that have added to the improvements of GFP to make it exciting. And I think about GFP really as a metaphor for what we, who we are as scientists. Because just as GFP takes in blue light and converts that and gives it off as green light, we take the ideas and observations of others, modify them by our own experiments and ideas, and then give them off, again, for other people to change them in turn. And it's really this cumulative effect that makes things so important. So the impact comes not from one individual, but we're all part of a chain in which we're all contributing to this. Very quickly, university and grant support were essential for this work. The university, because it doesn't care what I do, gives me absolute freedom to work on whatever I want, and I really appreciate that. You get that in other places too, but I really like being in a university for that. And grants are really important. The non-scientists don't understand funding. They think we get a contract. Now, a contract is you say, here are the four things I want to do. And if you think those are good things, pay me and I will do them. That's the kind of, if I don't, don't pay me. So you have to do those four things. We don't do that. We write a grant that says, here are the four things that right now are the most important things for us to do. If you think that our thinking is right and you think these are good ideas, you think we can accomplish this, you should fund us. And then there's the part that's not written that says, however, if someone comes up with GFP or something else like that, we're going to scrap all this nonsense and we're going to do something else. So I don't think, it, basically we all lie because we say we're going to do something over a four year period and I think at most it's probably six months that we really do. But it's that freedom to be able to follow your nose, to be able to see where uh, different things that I think is very important. The people that really do the innovation in the lab are the students and the postdocs. So many people called me up to ask about GFP and they all more or less started off with the same sentence. The sentence was, my postdoc or my graduate student told me that you have something called green fluorescent protein. What in the world is this and why do they want it? And I'd explain it and say, yep, that's a good idea and they, they get it. The driving force for these labs, the driving force in my lab are the students, both undergraduate and graduate students, and the postdocs that are actually doing the work and having the wonderful ideas. I hope this also tells you by the fact that Shimamura was working on an interesting biological problem that has nothing at all to do with human health, but an interesting problem, how do organisms produce light, that we should be looking at all of life and not concentrating on a few model organisms exclusively. That we need to really look at what this vast array of information is that's out there and understanding. And people are doing that. And finally, the most important thing, I think, is that basic research is really essential. Working on projects that you want to know what the answer is, and you can justify why you want to know about the answer. It's not that it's just, oh, I feel like it. But you actually can justify that it's an interesting scientific question. Is really important. People talk in the United States a lot about translational research, translating basic research into cures and preventive measures in the clinic. And as I get older, I really like that idea. I think that's good. So I'm not saying anything against that. It's the balance that's important. Because as many people have said, you need to have something to translate to be able to do translational research. And it's the basic research that feeds into all of these applications, things having to do with industry and with uh, 
medicine and so that we really need. So we really need to have a support of basic research. And that's risky because we don't know what's going to happen to it. No one would have predicted in 1962 when Shimomura had his paper that some silly worm guy would be listening and find out about it and work on it 30 years later and, and see that it was useful. Incredible impact. But, uh, you know, it was great science at the beginning. And I want to just end with my favorite quote about basic research. It was said by R. W. Wilson in uh, 1969. To put you in context, this is at the, uh, the time of the Vietnam War that the United States is in. And uh, Congress was debating whether to build what became the Fermi Lab, which was the world's largest particle accelerator until the CERN super collider came online a couple years ago. And uh, John Pastore, senator, uh, convened a uh, session, a joint session of science committee people to hear from Wilson, who is going to be the first director of the lab, he was its architect as well, why this was so important. And so Pastore says to him, Dr. Wilson, can you please tell the members of the committee how many things this lab will be useful for in terms of improving national security? Because we thought that was a good thing to convince the other people. And Wilson looked at him and said, none. This was not the answer that Pastore wanted. So he asked them again. Well, no, really, you what? No, nothing. Finally, Pastore says, look, in what respect will this benefit national defense. At which point, Wilson said the following. It has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with whether we are good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country, except to make it worth defending. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chelfi, for the very uh, uh, interesting and exciting talk. Um, I'm afraid that uh, we are addressed to I talked too long. That. <laughs> yeah. I'll <laughs> yeah, be happy schedule, to answer questions the, outside. <laughs> maybe we can have a few questions or comments. Mm. Oh, it's a very nice speech. So yes. firstly, thank you for mentioning my poster <laughs> very much. <laughs> And, and I have a question that uh, when you, uh, at the first time, uh, have the idea of using fluorescent protein in the worm, how could you choose GFP but not a quorin? How, how could you The decide? problem with a quorin is you need to put the substrate in. Calcium? Uh, uh, well, no, calcium is there. That wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but it is calcium regulated, so that's not always going to work. But it's more that a quorin what Shimomura found afterwards is that a quorin is actually two things. It's the protein called apoacorin, and the substrate that actually is needed to oh, generate light okay. called cilentrazine. And so once you get the flash of light, you've got to put more cilentrazine in to get it to go. So it's the same problem as all those other things. It's a two-component system. You have to add it. The other thing is the reason GFP was so exciting to me is you just keep shoving photons into this thing. You, don't, you know, it's not chemicals you're putting in, you're putting in photons. So you just shine yeah. more and more light on it, mm -hmm. and, and it works. So the, the idea of a fluorescent protein, I think, was even better because we could get such an incredible output because we could have such an incredible input. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, actually, I have um, two questions. First is, um, how stable is um, labeling um, proteins with GFP, to, oh, sorry, with um, uh, GFP? I mean, can I just label a protein in a bunch of cells, use some of them, freeze the others, come back like a month later, take the other ones? We frozen? routinely freeze worms and bring them back. That's a very important. Thing. Once. Uh, so the worms, and, and so GFP is a very stable protein. It, uh, 
It, 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 it's very stable to changes in pH. It's very stable against proteases. Uh, you can make it, you can destabilize it, and people, we have, in my lab have done this, and other people have done this, has made a destabilized GFP, because you often want to know not only when a gene is turned on, you want to know when a gene is turned off. So you can change it that way. But it, it is a very stable protein. Uh, my other question is about the, um, that figure you showed for the uh, HIV mm -hmm. uh, transfer. So uh, if this piece of the HIV is taken out from the integrity, um, does it mean that uh, if it's small enough, it can go through the gap junction? So blocking the gap jun junction can block the um, dissipation of this I through think the it's cells? more a receptor on the cell surface. And uh, I think there was a poster here also about different... Uh, receptors as well. So there's a number of different things that can do it, but it, it, it's not gap junctions that are forming between these cells in culture. I don't know about other cells, whether there might be some transfer mediated by that, but I, I, would, I, I, I would think not. I think the size is inappropriate for gap junction transfer. So the last thing is a request. So can you give us a couple of statements we can write to the, gra the granting bodies to convince them to fund our basic research? <laughs> I think everybody has to justify the work that they're doing uh, by uh, what the significance is going to be. And I don't think that significance is necessarily the idea that this is going to cure a disease or it's going to produce an application. It's going to have an immediate result. There is an increase in knowledge that I think is very important and is really essential. For years, Whenever any of us working on this worm wrote their grants, they would say, we would say in the thing, look, evolution is real. We didn't exactly say it like that, but we were essentially saying this. Evolution is real. So if we learn something in worms that we can look because of the way we can address things, looking at single cell resolution and look at a process that's involved in all biology, we're going to learn something that will eventually be important for this. And it's proven to be true. That was the astonishing thing, this line that we threw in that, you know, we're working on basic principles that are going to be important in the understanding of medically related problems actually turned out to be exceptionally true in this. And that was our justification. A lot of us just thought we were just throwing words around, but uh, it actually worked. And that, it, so I, I think that's it. If you're, if you're trying to understand a fundamental process, Eventually, you're going to find, that for many of these things, they're going to relate to something that someone may be able to apply. But I don't think that's completely the justification. I think that the other justification is just the gaining of knowledge and understanding the system. We are woefully ignorant about how biology works. We have the whole sequence of the human genome, but virtually er the vast majority of the genes are labeled as making proteins of unknown function. We don't have any idea what they do. So our knowledge is exceptionally small. And when you start to look at all the microbiome and all the other interactions, we're really, and we're constantly, at the beginning of understanding these things. And so one can predict how it's, what it's going to happen, but I just have this very profound feeling that it, the, everything is going to wind up being ultimately important as part of a puzzle. It depends how we put that puzzle together. Right. Okay, maybe we can have one more quick question. Okay. Right. Sir, my question is very simple. Can we control the intensity of the light color by tuning the calcium concentration? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Roger Chen's lab has made different calcium indicators that will actually fluoresce with different concentrations of calcium in the cell. So you can look at different ranges and stuff. And so they've been able, and also they've been able to calibrate how much the intensity of the light that comes out, how that relates to the calcium concentration. So people have used that as, as a way of looking at these things. Okay? Okay. Great. So let's thank Professor Chaffee again. And Let's move on to the poster session. Thank you so much.